Hello everyone, this is going to be a video about adding together different types of angular momentum in classical mechanics and as an illustrative example we're going to think about a system with just one planet orbiting one star. It could really be anything orbiting anything else but that will just give us something concrete that we can refer to throughout the video. Now what we're going to be interested in is the total angular momentum of the planet and you may be aware that if you want to find that total angular momentum, you have to consider two separate contributions, right? Firstly, you've got the orbital angular momentum, which is coming from the fact that the planet is moving around in this elliptical orbit about the star. So I'll just draw some arrows on this orbit here to illustrate that motion. That gives rise to some angular momentum, but the planet may also be spinning about its own axis, just like the Earth does, right? That's what's responsible for the day-night cycle on Earth. And so I'm gonna represent that potential rotation of the planet um, with just a little circular arrow over there. And spinning is a type of rotation and therefore spinning also gives rise to some angular momentum. So if we want the total angular momentum of our planet, we have to combine those two contributions. The main question I want to address in the video though is why is this actually okay? Because I've basically just told you that if you want the total angular momentum, you just add the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, which might seem like an obvious statement. You might be thinking, well, they're both angular momenta and so, of course, you can just add them together. However, I would suggest that this equation is not as self-evident as it might look at first, and that's not because the angular momenta have different types, because fundamentally they are both just angular momenta. It's because the orbital and spin angular momenta are measured with respect to different points. If you think of the definition of angular momentum, it depends on which point you choose as your reference position. If you choose a different reference position, you're going to get a different angular momentum. The orbital angular momentum is measured with respect to the center of mass of our system, which if the star is heavy, is basically the same thing as the center of the star. Well, the uh, the spin angular momentum is measured with respect to the center of mass of the planet. So what we want to spend some time doing is justifying why it's okay to add these two angular momenta even though they are measured with respect to two different points. So as a starting point, let's just write down our definition of angular momentum L, where by L I mean the total angular momentum um, it's going to be a sum. I'm writing it as a sum instead of an integral, which is fine to do because real matter is ultimately made of discrete particles. We're going to sum over all particles, which I'm going to index by i. Um, and by definition, angular momentum is the sum of ri crossed with pi, where ri is the position vector of particle i um, relative to our chosen reference point, and pi is the momentum of that same particle in some given um, reference frame. And I think it's going to make life a little bit easier um, if I explicitly write momentum as mass times velocity, um, so I'm going to write this as the sum of the mass of particle i times uh, the position vector crossed with the velocity vector. And just to be clear, the sum here is over all of the particles in the planet, right? All of the atoms that make up the planet. Now let's add a couple of useful things to our diagram. Let's suppose we're considering some particular particle, particle i within the planet, some arbitrary particle, which I'm going to draw as a little red dot in the planet there. What I'm going to do is add a couple of things. Firstly, um, let's just draw on the position vector of that particle, right? So with a blue arrow, that is um, what I called ri in the sum that I just wrote down. It's actually convenient to split that ri vector into two portions, right? Two contributions. Firstly, this big red arrow, which looks very similar to the blue arrow, but this is the uh, vector that takes you from the center of mass of the system, in other words, basically the center of the star, to the center of mass of the planet. And I'm going to give that the symbol um, capital R. But then we need another little contribution, which takes us from the center of mass of the planet to that particle that we're focusing on. And that's a tiny little arrow there. Um, I'm going to label that as R I dash, where the dash just emphasizes that it's still, you know, it's still a position vector, but it's just measured with respect to a different origin from Ri. Notice that the capital R vector doesn't need a subscript I because it's just the vector between the two centers of mass, um, and so it doesn't depend on which particle we're considering. It's just a constant. So this allows us to rewrite some of the terms in our sum. Let's write out the sum again. I'm going to omit the i at the bottom, just assume that we are already summing over i. Uh, keep the mass mi, but now I'm going to write the position vector ri as capital R, the center of mass vector, plus ri dash, where that just follows from the, uh, the vector diagram that I drew over on the left. I'm also going to rewrite the vi term using basically the same idea, which works because velocity is just the time derivative of position. So in the same way that for the position vector, we split it up into position of the center of mass of the planet plus the position vector relative to the center of mass of the planet, we can say that the velocity of our particle i in our original reference frame is equal to the velocity of the center of mass of the planet in that reference frame plus the velocity 
of particle i relative to the center of mass of the planet. And to be consistent with notation, I'm just going to call that relative um, velocity vi dash. So next, I'm just going to expand out those double brackets and write out each of the four terms that we're going to get explicitly, right? So we're going to have the sum of, firstly, um, mi times your center of mass position vector crossed with the center of mass velocity vector, right? That's coming from the first term in each of the brackets. Then the second term, again, you're going to have sum of mi times uh, capital R crossed with the relative um, velocity vi dash. Then you're going to get two more. Uh, you're going to have, again, mi, that's always there. This time, uh, ri dash crossed with the center of mass velocity. And finally, still mi, and now both terms with the dash, so ri dash crossed with vi dash. And then we're going to look at these terms one by one and think about how they simplify. So what I want to do next is take out any constant factors from all of these sums. Um, so what I mean by that is, for example, in the first term here, you'll notice that only the m has a subscript i, right? r and vcm are not dependent on which particle we're looking at. They're constants as far as the sum is concerned. So we're not really summing over r and uh, vcm. So just to make that explicitly clear, I'm going to insert some brackets around the sum of mi. Obviously, that doesn't make a difference, but I think it's conceptually helpful to show what we're summing over. Then we've just got this constant um, vector, which is r cross vcm. Applying the same idea to the next term, we notice that uh, the r is the only term that doesn't have an i this time. So we can take that out and put R crossed with the sum of um, m i v i dash like that. Um, how about the third term? Well, this time it's only the VCM that doesn't have an i. So I'm going to do the same thing I did for the first term, which is just put some brackets around the sum to make that clear what we're summing over. So sum of m i uh, r i dash crossed with vcm, which is a constant. We can't really do anything with this last term because all of the uh, individual symbols have subscript i. So I'm just going to copy that and put that at the end as it was before. So now have a look at the third term in our expression, and in particular, the bracketed bit of the third term, this sum of mi ri dash, and then think carefully about the definition of center of mass, because center of mass is defined as the position in space um, such that the sum of mass weighted position vectors of all particles in the system relative to that point is zero. But that quantity um, in the brackets is exactly the quantity I just described, right? It's the sum of mass weighted position vectors relative to the center of mass, because we've got that dash, which we earlier defined to mean relative to the center of mass, right? So this entire bracketed bit just becomes the zero vector, and therefore that third term is zero overall. Um, does anything else disappear? Well, have a look now at the second term in our um, in our expression. I did the third term first because I think that was easier. Uh, but look at this sum. We've got the sum of mi vi dash. Now, vi dash is just the time derivative of ri dash because velocities are just time derivatives of positions. But the mass weighted sum of position vectors relative to the center of mass is zero. So if we take the time derivative of zero, we still have zero. So this entire sum is also zero. And so the second term disappears as well. So that's already a huge simplification. Can we do anything with the other terms? Well, I think the only other thing we can really do involves the first term in our expression, because we've got the sum of mi, which is just saying add up all of the masses of all particles um, in the planet. And we could just call that capital M, right? We say the planet has a total mass of capital M. Maybe I should mark that on my diagram. Um, and then we can write that first term as r cross m v uh, cm. I'm just using some properties of the cross product here that allow us to take a constant um, in front of the cross product and put it in the middle of the cross product. Um, and then this last term, I'm still going to keep as it is. There's not much we can do with that. Now, how can we interpret each of these terms that we've ended up with? Well, this first one is the position vector of the center of mass of the planet crossed with the mass of the planet multiplied by the velocity of the planet's center of mass. Now, mv is, of course, just momentum. And so this mvcm um, is just the total momentum, linear momentum of the planet. So we're taking the position vector of the center of mass of the planet, crossing that with the total linear momentum of the planet. And that is, of course, the angular momentum due to the linear motion of the planet which is what we described earlier as the orbital angular momentum. So I'm going to say that first term we could just call L orbit. Finally, how are we going to interpret the second term? Well, let's rewrite it like this. Let's write it as the sum of 
uh, r i dash crossed with um, note that m i times v i dash could be written as p i dash, which is the momentum um, of the linear momentum of particle i um, as seen from a frame moving with the center of mass of the planet. This is just the definition of angular momentum, but this time our reference position is the center of mass of the planet because we've got dashes, right? So this term here is the angular momentum due to the motion of the particles within the planet around the center of mass of the planet, but that's exactly what we mean by spinning. And so that second term is the spin angular momentum. So there you go, there is a formal proof of what we set out to prove, which is nice. I guess ultimately the reason why this works comes down to the fact that the center of mass is defined in a very mathematically convenient way, um, such that some of those terms in our expanded sum just disappear. Of course, this analysis is firmly based in classical mechanics. You could, I suppose, if you wanted to use this as like an analogy for why this is okay to do in quantum mechanics as well, although it is strictly an analogy because especially spin angular momentum in quantum mechanics is not quite the same thing as it is in classical mechanics. Anyway, that's all. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.